right, man, it's a great day to be here in the house. Man, we are continuing our series uh, called For. Somebody tap somebody next to them and say, I'm for you. I'm for you. I'm for you. Somebody tap somebody next to them that you got here before them and said, I got here before you. You were late, but you made it. You made it. You're here. I'm glad that you're here this morning worshiping together. We desire, man, that stirred up some, some conflict in the room. I could feel it. I'm sorry. Some husband and wives who were rushing each other out the door, and now, now I just stirred up a fight. I didn't do my job right. Hey, it is, it's a great day. We strive to be known as a church that's not known by what we're against, but what and who we are for. We jumped off in that, in that uh, topic last week as we looked at John chapter 8. Today we're going to be in John chapter 9. If I haven't had uh, the privilege of meeting you yet today, my name is Joseph. I get to serve as the pastor here uh, at this incredible church family. And so we are so glad you're here. I hope you take the time to take a next step today, uh, whatever that next step might be because here's what we know and here's who we strive to be as a community. We want to not only be a church that is known in and of the com- in, and in the community by what we're for, but we want you to know that we are for you. That we are for you. I end every email with that line to remind myself before I send an email <laughs> that if this email is not crafted in a way that I am communicating to you that I am for you then I probably shouldn't send it. We are for you. We want God's best for your life, and we believe that happens in the context of community. So as we jump into John chapter 9, I want to just take us all into a a problem, an issue. You know that I have young kids, so if you don't have young kids, you can either look forward to that or just look across to that and say, I don't know what's wrong with you people who like to have children. Or you can look back to that maybe if you're in that season. But if you've ever been around young kids that are playing, their play always results in fighting. One way or another, (laughs) They always fight, right? They always fight. The best of friends are known by the biggest of fights, right? Uh, When it comes to, and what they love to do, especially our two kids, brother and sister, or four and six, is they literally do fight like brother and sister. And when they have a big fight, we automatically always hear, mom, right? And they're running to the other room. And what are they running to do? They're running to tattletale. And so we just started being like, no, I don't care what happened. He cut my arm off. I don't care. (laughs) You'll grow a new one, right? (laughs) Like we are like, if you're tattling, you're doing the wrong thing. And now you're in trouble, right? We're like shutting the tattletale down, right? Why does it bother parents so much with tattletale? And there's, there's something about blaming someone for your problems that just gets under our skin, right? We're like, handle it. Work it out. Sign a peace treaty. I don't know. Divide up in countries or something. Like, just work it out. Stop bringing me this problem. And I, but I think that it illustrates something that we honestly, if we, if we're honest, we never grow out of. We never grow out of asking ourselves this question: Who's to blame? Who's who's to blame for? the problems in our political system? Who's to blame for the gas prices? Who's to blame for the problems in our city? Who's to blame for the problems at work? Who's, who's to blame, right? We always, we, it even comes down to our marriage. This is one of those moments where you look straight ahead, not to the left or to the right. <laughs> You, you, you see problems brewing in your home and you're like, well, who's to blame? Well, it's if, if they would have listened to me, then this wouldn't have happened, right? If they would have, if they would have done what I told them to do, then I wouldn't be so mad at them, right? If, if, if we had done what I thought was best, then, well, long story short, you're to blame. And it goes even worse when we experience great pain right? You, you experience loss, you experience sickness, you experience a major financial setback. And then we start asking, well, who's to blame for my pain? And that's when it starts to get personal, right? It's, it's one thing that when, it's one thing when it's who's to blame when I've 
left out my uh, travel bag from our trip three weeks ago, and it's still sitting on the kitchen on the counter in our bathroom. <laughs> it, it's it's one thing to blame that. It's another thing to think about. I have serious pain in my life, and you're to blame. You, there's serious pain going on in my children, and you're to blame. Now they're grown up, and I look at what happened when they were little, and you're to blame. And what happens is we walk around with this mentality in our life, with this who's to blame mentality, trying to point the finger, trying to find the fault. And I've heard all of the, the silly explanations or the things, you know, if you point your finger, you got three pointing back, and it's like, okay, well, like that never stopped anybody. <laughs> and I think that what we realize in the story that we look at today in John chapter 9 is where the blame game ultimately takes us. And ultimately, what does Jesus say about this topic? Who is to blame? Who is to blame for our pain? And how do we even process consequences of our actions? Because here's the reality. And you read the book of Proverbs much, you'll see this, that, that if somebody is wilding out, they have a crazy lifestyle, they're making poor choices, a lot of times they will wreak havoc on their own heads, right? A lot of times our bad decisions do create bad circumstances. And there's a tension that we manage and we look like we're like, we can point to decisions people have made and relate it to the pain that they're experiencing. But just because we can make those relations doesn't mean that pain in general doesn't doesn't mean that suffering in general can all be pointed to one specific action. It doesn't mean that we get to run around as Christians saying, you're to blame. You're to blame. Because here is the reality. If we are to blame for every bad circumstances in our life or the others, then ultimately, at the end of the day, we would be the only one who could save what is broken in the world. And I know this. I'm a really crafty savior. <laughs> I'm going to mess it up. Ultimately, there are a lot of things in my life that you can blame, but I think that there is a better way. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it goes like this. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, here we go. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. So Jesus, moving, walking with his disciples, it says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, let, last week we asked this question, what do I see in Jesus that I don't see in me? What do I see when I look at the life of Jesus that I don't see in my life? Okay, and when we ask ourselves that question, here's what we can't do. We can't go to this book and look for all the truth bombs and statements to beat people over the head with. But because here's what we do. We go look for a sharp edge in the sword and then we point it at someone and say, you're to blame. We, we can't just take the true statements that Jesus made or Paul made. We have to take the way that they walked and talked. And so when Jesus walked and talked, it says, as he passed by, he saw a man that was blind from birth, probably begging in a vulnerable situation. This would be someone who you would just walk right by, but Jesus noticed him. Verse 2, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, and you're like, oh man, this is, this is a good moment, right, with the teacher. We're going to ask him what, what he thinks. All right, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Uh, let's let's ask, him, ask him this question. Now, obviously, what's happening here is the disciples are, are bringing up a common debate in, in their society. It's a common thing that they would say, okay, like if there's somebody who's experienced such great an ailment as to be blind from birth, somebody did something wrong, <laughs> right? Somebody's to blame. It's got to be somebody's fault, right? No way that would happen if it wasn't a consequence of someone's Sin, that was the common belief because we do see in our life, uh, we do see an effect of I've made a decision, now I get a negative consequence. And because that, that becomes by logic extrapolated onto God's character. You gotta be really, you gotta be really careful when you take your logic and put it on top of God's character. And so what had happened is, is they're saying, okay, well, it, somebody had to have messed up. And because of that belief, 
it attributed to a greater level of people that were ostracized from society. Now, here's the reality, that we do have consequences for our sin. So we do have consequences for our sin. It's just that they're much worse than just being blind or having a sickness. The consequences are sin. Romans 3.23 says, everybody sin. Somebody look at somebody next to them and say, we're all messed up. <laughs> You're messed up. I'm messed up. <laughs> we're... <laughs> We're all messed up. Look at your kids or just, just think about them over there in the hallway and say, you're messed up. <laughs> we're, we're all sinners. Romans 3, 26, we're all sinners and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And then in chapter 6, it says this. You know what the consequence of that sin is? It's death. The wages of sin are death. The, so the, the consequence is way greater than just temporary suffering. The only way that you can pay for the mistakes that you've made is with your life. And so that's the reality of the consequence of sin. And so Jesus answered, they they said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And they've they've got it backwards. Now realize, remember this, last week we made this statement, and I think it's pertinent to keep talking about it. The enemy will lure you into pointless conversations. Why does he do this? We're going to put this on the screen. The enemy will lure you from pointless conversations to drive a wedge between you and the people God has called you to reach. So he will take you into these arguments so that you, he will keep you from being effective with the calling that he's put on your life. So you start trying to figure out, man, why is this person experiencing this setback? Well, they probably just like, they, they did it to themselves. Anybody ever said that? <laughs> oh, they, they did it to them. They brought it on themselves. They did it to themselves. They, they just, they put themselves in that scenario. And most of that, some of that is probably true. But here's what the enemy will do in a very crafty way. We try to figure it out with our own logic why suffering exists. We try to figure it out with our own logic why pain exists in someone's life. We try to figure it out with our own logic and it drives a wedge between us and the people he has called us to reach. Jesus won't have that. So they're like, okay, let's, let's talk about this over here while that person is just suffering over there. Jesus, why do you think he's like that? Do you think it was, did he mess up or did his parents mess up? Let's talk about that. They're like, you know, putting the pencil behind their ear, to, like they're ready to go. Their tablets are open. They're ready to take notes from the teacher. And this is what he said. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. So he, he's like, which they're probably a little confused at this moment. They're like, I thought there was consequences for sin. And they're saying, he's saying, you're looking, actually looking at the wrong thing. It wasn't that this man sinned or his parents, the rest of the verse says this, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So here's the point. They were looking at the sin, not the purpose. They were looking at the mistake, not praying for the miracle. They, they were focused on what they could see, which was the mess. And what they would eliminate themselves from being able to experience by actually getting to know the person is the miracle. So they interacted with Jesus saying, hey, was it this man's sin? Was it this man's sin or his parents? Like, who messed up? And he's like, it's ni- neither of those things. The purpose of the suffering that he's experienced is that the works of God might be displayed in him. God allows suffering. Listen, this is very tough because some of you have suffered a lot. Some of you have suffered loss. Some of you have had to deal with pain in your life that is immeasurable. Some of you have suffered so many things, but listen, God allows suffering and unexplainable loss so that he might display his power and goodness through the lives of people. In other words, I'll say it like this. Our pain is his platform. Our pain is his platform. He he loves to stand on the stage of our pain. Like nobody has ever said, I've never, like I I hear people all the time, don't we have an incredible worship team? Can we give it up for our worship team? Just leading us, come on, not a golf clap. It is the players this weekend, but incredible worship that we get to experience every week and not just the the level the quality but the their hearts and the way that they lead us isn't I've never heard anybody walk up to 
Josh or Julianne or Alina or Jose or anybody who leads us in worship and go, man, <clears throat> that was a beautiful stage you stood on today. Like that stage, did you see the bricks? <laughs> like, like, could you just see the way that stage was just like, man, it was, uh, that stage ushered me to the throne room of grace. I was just, I was right there just connecting with Jesus because, man, that stage was sturdy. What is that? Is it wood? Is it, con- is it concrete? It's nice and it's got the nice little like rounded edge. Nobody's ever come up to me after and said, Pastor, Man, I was so blessed during that word. The stage was just usher. I mean, nobody says that. When we came to the Green Valley uh, High School performance, they performed Annie beautifully. They came out and they all took a bow, right? And they're all like, this. they did an incredible job, high school students doing this, st- this performance right here on this stage. And nobody was like, man, that stage held up for all three hours of that performance. <laughs> they didn't say that. The purpose isn't the stage. This this isn't, this props up the experience that we, so that we can look up and connect with Jesus, right? So, So when you compliment somebody about their worship leading, you're like, man, when you sang, I just, I was able to sing to Jesus too. Hey, hey, when you were preaching the word, I was able to connect with Jesus right there too. Uh, when you, but you know what? If I was hidden behind the curtain, you wouldn't be able to see me. But because God gave us a stage, it allows us to be used, right? This is us. We're just a stage. We are a stage and a platform for his glory and grace. This is how Paul says it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. He says, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? My power is made perfect in strength. No? Come on, we got to wake up. My power is made perfect in what? Weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of where I am strong. No. I will boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Listen, I'm honored just to be a stage. I'm honored just to be a platform. I'm honored just to have the power of Christ stand on top of me. I don't want any of the praise, any of the glory. We, we want to be a stage for Jesus, but when you're a stage, you suffer. When you're a stage, you experience pain. When you're a stage, you're actually no more for your weakness than you are for your strength. When you're a stage, you prop up. You don't receive the glory. Paul says, listen, it's in my weakness that your power is made perfect. Too often, we are trying to point the blame at people so that we can prop ourselves up and look important. We're trying to shift the blame. We're trying to figure it out. Why? So that we can seem powerful, so that we can be in control, so that we can have the authority. Look, the disciples, they were shifting the blame and they were missing the person. We're shifting the blame, but he's setting the stage. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if it's a maybe it's something with your family dynamic. Maybe you are severing ties with someone in your family. Maybe somebody is is run out. Maybe you're having trouble with a kid. Maybe you're having trouble with a former, uh, someone that you were in a relationship with. I don't know what pain there is in your life where you're shifting the blame, you're having a financial struggle, you're battling through sickness with somebody and you're shifting blame around. You're pointing fingers and really if you pay attention to what God is doing, he's setting the stage. He's setting the stage, not for a public humiliation. He's setting the stage to display his power. Somebody say it with me. Say, set the stage. Set the stage. Say it again. Set the stage. Here we go. 
You said it. You got to mean it. Now, here we go. Verse 4. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. Because in the words of the great Avril Lavigne, you just might get it. All right. We must work the works of him. Verse 4. We just might work. We, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. What Jesus is saying is, I'm here for a purpose. His life, the 33 years of his life, he's, equivoc- he's equivalenting to the day time, the work, what he's there to display, right? But he's saying the night is coming. I'm going to be crucified. There are things that I need to do while I am in flesh here on this earth. And then when, when it's night, and no one can work because this is what he said in verse 5. As long as I am the light, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So the stage is set. The suffering is in place. And here's where Jesus steps into this moment. Lights, camera, action. Here he goes. Verse 6. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Like this is kind of getting gross. <laughs> then he anointed the man's eyes with mud. He, he said these things. He, he's like, listen, we got to do this while it's day because it's going to be night when no one can work. And while I'm in the world, I've got to be the light of the world. And they're probably a little bit confused. And you might be a little bit confused by that. And that's okay. But he says, but he said those. And then watch what he did. He spat on the ground, made mud with saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. The anointing is, a, is an intentional touch, but it doesn't just stay there. Anointing never is meant to stay in the place where the anointing happens. He anointed the man's eyes with the mud. It, it, had, a, it, had, a, it had a purpose. There's an image here. And there's a lot of people that think a lot of different things, but here's what I think is, is painfully clear. It's reminiscent of the moment when Jesus, you know when Jesus created man, what did he use? Anybody remember? Dirt. Somebody, wives, look at your husband, punch him, say, you're a dirt bag. <laughs> You just, you may, you're just a bag of dirt. Like we, we were made literally, Jesus, he picked up dirt and he made man. He made us from the dust. And, and to recall that John has a lot of image and imagery in his gospel about that points back to creation. And so when Jesus bends down and he's in the dirt, it's, it's reminding us that Jesus is creator. It's reminding us of his creative power. And and by making the mud, what we see in the prophets in Isaiah and Jeremiah, what what do we see about the character of God? It says, uh, the prophets say, uh, God says, listen, I'm the potter, you're the clay. So, So when that moldable clay, when I get it in my hands, I make something beautiful. And when Jesus gets down and he's in the dirt, we're reminded that he's creator, but he's, he's also the potter. He, he, he makes us, he also shapes us. And, and he makes that mud and he anoints his eyes and man, what is going to happen next? If we get those two pictures that, listen, Jesus made you, and now we say this almost every week, you will never meet a person who was not made in the image of God, and that includes you. You will never meet a person who was not made in the image of God, and that includes you. And if he made you, he intends to use you. If he made you, he intends to shape you. And so when he bends down and he makes that mud and he anoints his eyes, we got to pay attention to what happens next because what happens next is so powerful and we have to grab hold of it. Verse 7, and he said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. John gives us that note, that pool of Siloam means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. He he went and he washed and then came back seeing. Don't miss the progression here of the miracle. Okay, Jesus answers this question. He doesn't let the pointless argument get in between him and the person that he's called to reach. He approaches the man. He uses very specific, very clear imagery to to remind us, I'm creator, I'm also shaper, I'm the maker, I'm also the potter, right? And then he says, he commands to the man with his eyes just caked in mud. (laughs) 
some of you wonder, like, maybe you've given your life to Jesus, and you feel like your life is just a, still a mess. <laughs> you feel like you still can't see. Because it's, it's, it's not always just this instantaneous moment when Jesus meets you. You, you see, when he anoints you, when, when he touches you, there, there's, a, there's a process called sanctification. Listen, the, the work that he does in salvation can never be taken away from you. That, that work happens right there in that moment, and you are saved. But listen, there's a step in sanctification of being seen that requires that you obey. And, and you feel like you can't see. You feel like there are things impending your judgment. You feel like, I just still don't know what God is calling me to do. I feel, still don't feel like I can, I, I know my healing is there, but I can't access it. Why can't I access the freedom in my marriage? Why can't I access the freedom in my finances? Why can't I access the joy or the peace that passes understanding? That's just a verse that the pastor prayed over me one time, and I have no idea what that even means, <laughs> Right? I'm supposed to have this joy and all I feel is despair. I would say you probably have something in your life you have not obeyed. Listen, we're going to skip that next verse. Go to this statement. When you go where God calls you to go, you'll see what God wants you to see. When you go where God calls you to go, you will see what God wants you to see. Some of you don't have a salvation problem, you have an obedience problem. You don't, you don't have a problem with God. God has saved you and you've given your life to him and you, and you keep showing up. But he sent you and you haven't gone. He, he's put his hand on you and you haven't said yes. He's, he sent you and you're still walking around with mud in your eyes. Walking into door frames and stuff like tripping over the edge of the couch that's been there for 13 years. Like you still don't know your way around because you still have mud on your eyes. And listen, the power, the obedience releases us to experience the miracle. The obedience releases us to experience the miracle. The healing happens by the anointed touch of Jesus. The healing is experienced by the obedience of Jesus' commission. The power is in the commission. The, po the power is in the anointing. The releasing is in the commission. Verse 8, so here's what happened to the man. Then the neighbors and those who had used to seen him as a beggar, they were saying, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? They're like, that looks like that guy, right? You ever have that moment? Maybe you have that moment like on the strip or something. You're like, I think that's Tommy Lee Jones, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, I think I see someone that might be like, this is a doppelganger moment, right? Like, I think that's him, but it really doesn't look like him, but it kind of looks like him. And some said, and then they, they literally have this argument, verse 9. Some said, it's he. Others said, no, but he's like him. He kind of looks like him, though. You're you kind of right. Like, he, like, and he kept saying I am the man. He's like, no, 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 I am that man who used to sit here in bed. So they said to him, don't miss this. Then how were your eyes open? Then how? Then how were your eyes open? What, what about your life is so different after you met Jesus that when people look at you, they say, then how? then how all this stuff is happening in your life, all this suffering you're experiencing, then how do you have joy? Now, you, 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 you're experiencing these setbacks and you're experiencing uh, like sickness in your family and then how? How do you have peace? Then, then how? Then, then how did you make friends when you came to a new city? Then how do you feel this content about your circumstance? Then how? Listen, I would say this. If nobody's asking this about your life, and I'm not saying this to beat you up, we're always growing. That's one of our values. We're always growing, and we've never arrived until we've arrived with Jesus, right? And so, but if nobody's ever asking you, then how? Then how do you experience that kind of joy? Now I would ask you, have you, have you went? I know that's not good grammar, <laughs> But have you went? Did you go? Did you say yes? Did you go and wash when he said go and wash? Did you obey? 
Listen, there's an obvious picture. That pool of Siloam was, was used for, it was used for ritualistic cleansing. It was also used for, for a, as a water source. And there's a lot in this text that's happening that we don't have time to, to jump into today. But you know what it was also used for? Baptisms. Some, some people ask, like, why is baptism so important? It doesn't save you. No, it doesn't save you. And I don't, I don't necessarily believe that that man walking to that pool healed him. I think Jesus, the power was in the anointing and the sending. The healing was in his touch. The releasing of the miracle was in the obedience. You know why baptism is important? Because it's obedience. It's us saying, yes, Jesus, I will. Yes, I will show the world what happened. Listen, what happened inside his eyes, he had to let off the shell so that people could see what happened inside on the outside. So when you step into those waters, come on, what happened on the inside is now a picture on the outside, right? It's a step of obedience that shows what has happened on the inside, And so many times we don't experience that because we hold things close to our chest and we decide, no, I don't want to go. That's not important. I'm already saved. I have my salvation. You know, that's that's what keeps us at home so many times from church. Oh, no, no, no. Like I can go sometimes, but no, it's an obedience thing to, to show up regularly, to experience the community of God together. He says, don't forsake gathering together. Why? Because when you show up, you experience the miracle. When you obey, you experience the miracles. These then how moments are when you experience what God wants to do in your life. Because listen, the healing we experience is not about what we've done. It's about who we've met. The healing we experience is not about what we've done. It's about who We've met, and because here's what his response was. They said, then, then how? How is your countenance different? How are you healed? How is your depression? How are you overcoming this depression that was in your life? How have you overcome this anxiety? How have you overcome this sin? You fill in the blank for the then how that you have in your story. What, and what they really want to know is this. What self-help plan did you follow? <laughs> what influencer are you on on IG? Like, what, what, what? What did you do? What steps did you take to experience that level of freedom? It's not about what we've done. It's about who we met. And here's what he said, verse 11, first part of verse 11. He answered, the man called Jesus. The man called Jesus. I wonder if for us we need to reframe our answers. Stop trying to explain how you've experienced healing and freedom and start trying to explain who gave it to you the man called Jesus the man called then how do you have peace when your kids are rebelling the man called Jesus then how do you have faith when you have a financial setback the man called Jesus come on somebody say this next one with me then how do you walk with so much confidence when you're between jobs and don't know where the ends are going to meet then how do you trust the Lord for healing when you're experiencing sickness or it's in your family? The man called Jesus. It's not how, it's who. It's not how, it's who. He answered, the man called Jesus. This is what he did. He made mud and he anointed my eyes. And he said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So what did he do? So I went and I washed and received my sight. Listen, I don't know the miracle you're praying for in your life. And I'm not trying to, this is not a works-based salvation. But I think there's something about receiving the healing that God wants to offer you that's on the other side of your obedience. It's not about his capacity to do it, and it's not about you performing it. It's about your heart getting in the place where you can access it. It's about you walking forward in faith and obedience. This man just put mud on his eyes, and he said, go, wash wash this mud off of your eyes. 
So, so he had to go to this place where he wouldn't have been accepted. You understand? He, he had to go to this pool that he would have been rejected from. He, he had to put himself through that humiliation. He washed his eyes and then he received his sight. Here's the application. Are we known for who we blame or who we bless? Because the disciples, they were looking for every reason to blame someone else for this man's suffering. They were looking for every reason to talk about his, uh, his ailment, why he's in that position, what's the problem, let's figure this out, who sinned, was it his, man? What is it? Was it his parents, was it him, and who's to blame, pointing the finger. And Jesus said, my life is not about blaming. I didn't come to condemn the world, I came to save the world. Is your life about blaming? Is it about pointing the finger? Because here's our first point. I want you to write this down. And the band's going to come up as we close. When you want to blame, I want you to choose to bless. Choose to bless. Here's what that means. Instead of being critical, have a conversation. Instead of being condemning, I invite someone over for dinner. here's what it means. It means instead of trying to figure out why that person has so many problems in their life, why don't you go pray with that person over a cup of coffee and be with them, be close to them, help them discern what's next in their life. Maybe it's a step of obedience that you can encourage them to take, but you won't know that if you don't get close. You won't know that if you just sit from afar and say, and talk and gossip Really, what the disciples were doing with Jesus, they were trying to spur on gossip. They were trying, hey, what do you think? You think you think he messed up? You think his parents messed up? You know, I heard his parents were really into, you know, I saw him down there on the strip. Like, <laughs> I, you know, that wasn't his first one, I'll tell you that. <laughs> They were gossiping, and Jesus was blessing. Jesus is like, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. We're all sinners. It's not about his sin. He's blind. He's blind, which, by the way, we're all spiritually blind before you meet me. He's he's blind. It's it's not about his sin. This is about his condition of pain that allows him to be a platform for my glory. Because every source of suffering and pain, you know why God allows suffering to stay in the world? Why he allows pain to stay in the world? Because when, when Adam sinned and he chose to be for himself before he was for his wife. When he chose selfishness and introduced sin to the world, we all inherited that sin nature. And we all, by by nature, Paul tells us, we're children of wrath. And so because we live in a world that is full of sin, we suffer the consequence of sin. So yeah, sometimes people will will have consequences as a direct result of their sin, but sometimes a kid gets leukemia. Sometimes a city's wiped out by an earthquake. Sometimes things happen that are not necessarily a direct result of someone's sin. They're the impacts of a world that is cursed by sin, that we live in. And if we can identify that pain and that suffering, and stand on it with Jesus and say, listen, my pain is your platform. If people watch how I suffer, if people watch my pain and they give glory to God for the way that I have endured it, for the way that I've carried it, man, that's the goal. That someone might watch you suffer and not say, oh man, how could a good God let something happen to a good person? All of us have sinned, and all of us live in a broken world, and I don't know why certain things happen to other people and not others. That would be me trying to figure it out and impose my logic onto God's character, and that's not what I'm going to do. 
And I'm going to look here and I'm going to say he was close to the man who was blind and he healed him. And you know why he healed him? Not to atone for his parents' affair. (laughs) Not to atone for his own mistake. No, he healed him to display his power. And I hope whatever you're walking through this morning, whatever you're watching other people's walk, other people walk through, you'll choose to bless, not blame. You'll choose to say yes. Number two, here's the second application. It's gonna be life-changing. You ready for this? Go means go. Go means go. I'm sitting at a red light with Cannon. Now he's learning the rules of the road, which is the worst thing that happens in the life of a child. Because now he's going to be backseat driving for the next 10 years till I kick him out of the car. And when the light turns green and I'm not paying attention, go, Dad, go! (laughs) Go means go. He's He's called you to be obedient. Be obedient. Go to the person, go to the neighbor he's called you to go to. Take the step of obedience and get baptized. Start the conversation. Join the serve team. Take the step of obedience and take your wife with you to counseling. Not take your wife to counseling and drop her off. (laughs) You're like, it's spiritual leadership. (laughs) No, spiritual leadership is you going in first. Go. Go. Some of you are doing that. And I'm proud of you. You're putting in work and you're obeying. And you're doing the hard things. And I'm proud of you. And I'm telling you, you need to trust God for the miracle that's coming in your life, in your marriage, in your family. And you need to inspire someone else to go to. Take the step. Take the step. So what's next for you? What's next for you? Do you need to give your life to Jesus for the very first time? You've never experienced, you've never, he's never even anointed you in that way. You've never had that encounter with Jesus. I'm gonna pray. And when I pray, as soon as I say amen, there's gonna be four people in the back of each aisle with some lanyards that say what's next. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, you need to just, as soon as I say amen, we start this song, you need to make your way to it. Maybe you need to make the step of being baptized and you want to get on the calendar for that or you need to join this serve team or whatever your next step is or maybe you just need prayer. Take that step. Move to the back of the room. This altar is open. Let's get ourselves in a posture where we can receive from and hear the Spirit of God. Let's choose to bless when we want to blame. Let's choose to go when we want to stay. Jesus, I pray for courage right now in this moment. As some of our ministry leaders make their way to the back of the room, I pray right now that you would give the person right now that is battling whether or not they should walk back there, give them the courage and the confidence to move where you're telling them to move. Go means go. So right now in this moment, Jesus, Give us the confidence to move forward. Give us the patience to walk at your pace and allow us to experience the healing that you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we sing.